So my name's Mike Warner. I'm from Imperial College in London. I'm part of a group that's uh, spent quite a long time, maybe 15 years or so, developing uh, full waveform inversion codes to run on field data. What I was going to do this morning was give you an overview of how full waveform inversion works, and I was particularly going to take you through one field data, one field data set, so show you the steps that we use, how we invert that data set, what we need to worry about, and uh, especially how we, how we um, validate um, the results. So that, that's a plan of the talk. I've got about 10 slides which give you an overview. Then we'll go through step by step through this data set and I'll, f I'll finish up explaining why we think the results we get from full waveform inversion um, are correct. So this is, this is supposed to be a tutorial. It's not supposed to be a formal lecture. So I, I'm very happy if people want to stop me, ask questions, ask me to move forwards and backwards, ask me to speed up or slow down. So it is supposed to be interactive. So if you want to ask questions, please wave at me. I may not notice. If I don't notice, stand up and shout at me and, and, and I'll answer questions as we, as we go along. I'm very, I'm very happy to do that. And I'd like to, we're a relatively small group. I'd like this to be a fairly informal meeting with a lot of discussion and feedback. So the first, the first talk really will set that, will set that tone. So please ask me questions if you or, or, or join in, tell me that you don't agree with what I'm saying, and uh, and, and let's make it, let's try and make it, uh, try and make it interactive. So, so I'll start with this overview of full waveform inversion. So these these three bullet points really introduce the topic. So the first thing, what is full waveform inversion? It's in that first, first bullet point. It's a means of making models of the subsurface. They're high resolution, by which we mean they're very spatially well resolved. We can see small features in the subsurface and we can separate those small features. So that's what I mean by high resolution. It's high fidelity, and what I mean by high fidelity is the models are supposed to be correct. They're supposed to match what's really in the subsurface. We're not trying to make pictures or processing parameters. We're really trying to make models which if you were to drill holes in the world, you would measure the same numbers. You'd see the same numbers down those boreholes. So we're trying to make genuine quantitative um, models, quantitative pictures of what the subsurface looks like. Um, these are models of physical properties. And the most common property that uh, full waveform inversion generates is P-wave seismic velocity. But we can invert for other things too. And you'll see in later talks today and tomorrow that um, it's possible to invert for a wider range of parameters. But certainly commercially, I think P-wave, simple, straightforward P-wave velocity is probably 95%, maybe 80, maybe 90, 98%. Of, of what's done commercially is done to get P-wave velocity. And the other few percent is done typically to get anisotropic parameters associated with, with P-wave velocity. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get high resolution, high fidelity models of the subsurface. Um, how do we do this? We try and find a model which, at least in, pr in principle, is capable of predicting all the field data that we've measured. So if we do this perfectly, the idea is we get a model, we could throw away the field data, all the field data is supposed to be contained in that model, and that model should be able to predict all the field data, and by predict, I mean it should produce the field data wiggle for wiggle. If a seismogram looks like this, the model is supposed to produce exactly the same seismogram. Now in practice, there are difficulties doing that. We typically can't afford to do this, we can't afford the computational effort to do it for the full bandwidth of the data. So we typically only do it at a relatively limited bandwidth. But that's what we're attempting to do. We're trying to find a model that completely predicts everything that we know about the data, all the, all the aspects of the data that we've recorded. And the method has, well, the method's been around since about 1982 when it was first proposed. It's been practical for three-dimensional field data sets within the last few years. The first, the first results began to appear in public in about 2008, and full waveform inversion is now, it's a service that all the major service companies uh, can offer. It's something which 
Um, most oil companies either can do internally or they use uh, with service companies, and it's a growing um, it's a growing technology. And some of the largest oil companies will apply full waveform inversion to every new data set um, that they acquire. So it's gone from 10 years ago something that was largely of academic interest to something today that is of commercial interest that's used right uh, right across the industry. And that's happened partly because hardware has got faster and partly because the algorithms for carrying out and the expertise for carrying out full waveform inversion has, uh, has got better. So things have changed dramatically in, in the last few years. Um, so to motivate the talk or to motivate why, why we're going to do this, I'll show you the final result or a final result um, at the beginning and you'll, you can see why uh, full waveform inversion is important. So this, is, this shows uh, a piece of a 3D seismic data set. So this is a vertical slice. This is a horizontal slice. The horizontal slice is through there at the level of this, um, of this arrow. This is from the data set that I'm going to go through in detail. This arrow is about, the, the reservoir is in, is in here somewhere. This is a, a, a clastic section and then there's a chalk section and the oil sits in this chalk section. This region in here represents a gas cloud, so there's a shallow accumulation of gas, which makes the imaging quite difficult uh, in this region. And the, the um, structure here is a gentle anticline or gentle dome. It basically looks like this in three dimensions. And this um, oval feature here, this is a slice basically through that dome and one of these reflectors, this one I think, is the reservoir at this, um, at this depth. So that picture is, is a, an image of the subsurface. It was made from this data set. It was made using uh, conventional technology, but very good technology. This was made by the um, processing contractor that acquired and processed this data. It's a reverse time migration, which is a high quality migration. Um, Pre-stack depth migrated and using a, an anisotropic velocity model, basically the best velocity model that the, uh, that the contractor could build. And this is the vertical section and not the horizontal section. So if we take that same data set and we apply full waveform inversion to it, we get a new velocity model, a different uh, velocity model, a better velocity model, and we can re-migrate the data. And um, if we do that, um, the picture looks like this. So as I flick backwards and forwards, you can see the comparison. So an awful lot has changed. The data going in is exactly the same. The migration algorithm is exactly the same. The only thing that's changed is the, um, the velocity model, the P-wave velocity model that's used to migrate the data. And um, as, I, as, I go backwards and, as I go backwards and forwards, you can see in, in this section, there's a lot more energy in these reflectors. They're a lot simpler. Um, there, there was some um, crossing energy and complications and lack of focusing in this region, and that's much improved. In this region, things are fairly flat in this model, and in the original, there was structure in here caused basically by the gas cloud. So this, this migration, anybody that's used to looking at these sections would think, would believe that this migration is much better than the original. But the picture that's really interesting or really important is this one. What you can see here is in the original, we have this rather distorted, structurally complicated oval shape. It's, it's not a simple dome. The dome is, has got um, structure in it. When we migrate it with this much more complicated, much higher resolution velocity model, the structure itself gets much, much simpler. It's revealed as actually a very simple dome. Um, all that extra structure is all um, an artifact of using the wrong velocity model. And when we use the right velocity model, the, um, the structure simplifies quite dramatically. The shape of the oil field changes, the size changes, the depth of the oil water contact changes, the way you would drill this, the way you would produce this, everything basically changes about this reservoir simply because we've improved the velocity model. And um, you can see the changes are really quite dramatic. In fact, in this case, this reservoir is probably economic. Um, 
This one is probably not economic. So the volume of oil has shrunk, um, or the, the predicted volume of oil has shrunk by applying that better velocity model. So if we didn't have this model, then we'd go ahead and drill that. We'd have our predictions of how much oil we get out would be wrong. But now we can see that the, the, the reservoir is a different shape, and we would invest in this and produce this quite differently. So full waveform inversion has the potential to do really quite commercially valuable things um, to oil fields and change the way you evaluate them, the way you produce them, the way you drill them, um, and so forth. So that's, that's really to motivate, that example is to motivate uh, where we're going to do, where we're going to go. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you how we get towards, how we get towards those pictures. So back to the idea, um, and I've got this statement, some of you will work in conventional migration. Um, so that can be a problem. Um, most of what you, you know, most of your experience, most of what you've um, been taught or learned about conventional migration, conventional imaging, um, is not much use for full waveform inversion, and indeed it's often wrong. It often leads you in the wrong direction. So some of the key characteristics the full waveform inversion is shown here. Um, the first thing it needs is low frequencies, and it needs the frequencies to be as low as we can possibly get. So we often start at 5 hertz, or 4 hertz, or 3 hertz, or even 2 hertz, and uh, if we could get to 1 hertz, or even half a hertz, then we would be very pleased. Uh, in practice, we can't get that low. It's, in many, many surveys, it's very difficult to get below about 3 hertz. But we really want to push down to the lowest frequencies that we can possibly get to. And that's different to conventional seismics. In conventional seismics, you're often interested in pushing up to the very highest frequencies that you can get to. And we want low frequencies in this technique. Um, the second thing is we, by and large, don't use reflections. Well, at least we use them, but we get most value or most um, uplift in the model, not from the reflections, but from transmitted arrivals. So that's, say, from energy that's... that's gone down, turned, been refracted, and, and come back on ray paths that look like this, not an energy that's gone straight down and, and, and been reflected back. So these transmitted arrivals are very important, and I'll show you those when we, when we look at the data. So these are two things that are very, very different to conventional seismic imaging. Um, the third thing that's important is that in full waveform inversion, we have a starting model, and the starting model needs to be good. So we need to have a good idea of what the answer is going to be. And when we've got that good idea of the answer, then we can go forward and improve it and get an even better idea of the answer. Uh, by, by Basically by iterating, by, by going around a loop and improving the model step by step. And you'll see in full waveform inversion, the quality of this start and where we start from can be very important. And one of the key things in full waveform inversion is to is to get good starting models, but also to try to develop methods that are less sensitive to the quality um, of, the, of the starting model. And you'll hear more about those later in the, uh, later in the meeting. And then I think the final thing, which is perhaps the most significant thing about full waveform inversion, is it's not a method that fails elegantly. And what I mean by fails elegantly, many, many methods that we use if you get them a bit wrong, if you do something slightly wrong, you get an answer which is slightly wrong. And if you do them a bit more wrong, the answer is a bit more wrong. Full waveform inversion is not like that. Full waveform inversion, if you make small errors, it may be fine and everything, you still may get the same answer and everything will be fine. If you make a slightly bigger error to begin with, then it may go catastrophically wrong. It may fall off a cliff and give you completely the wrong answer. So it has these large instabilities in it, and that means the details, doing things right, um, are often very, very important. They're absolutely critical. And if you do things a little bit wrong, you end up with completely the wrong answer. So that's a, in a commercial context, that's a difficult, um, a difficult feature of, a, of a, a, a method and something that we need to be very, 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 very aware of. So you need to be... Um, the software needs to be clever to get around that. The practitioners need to be clever. The data needs to be appropriate, and uh, we really don't want to. We really don't want to end up with them um, uh, with, with a catastrophically wrong result. And most of what we do with seismic data is not like that. Most of what we do, it, it just 
it fails gradually as we, um, as we do something wrong. Um, the, basic, the basic workflow or the basic idea in full waveform inversion is very often like this. Not always, there are other ways to do things, but very often it's like this. And the idea is, here's some target that we're interested in. Here's, a, here's our oil field down here. We're going to image that with reflected energy, with energy that looks something like this. But that reflected energy travels through some relatively shallow layer, some near-surface heterogeneity, which might be two kilometers thick, something like that. So maybe this is two kilometers thick, and this is six kilometers deep. This shallow heterogeneity has a big effect on these ray paths a big effect on this imaging and the way full waveform inversion is often used is to use these sorts of ray paths, these turning rays, this transmitted energy to get a much better model of this green region. So we do full waveform inversion in here with these ray paths and then having done that we use these ray paths to migrate, oops, to migrate the um, Uh, to migrate the data that comes down here. So this data is migrated using this model that we've built from, uh, from full waveform inversion. So two steps, use the, the shallow wide angle data to build this model and then having done that, use the deeper shorter offset reflected data to migrate through that shallow, um, through that shallow velocity model. That's, that's a typical workflow, not the only way, but the, a typical workflow that's used um, in full waveform inversion. So now I want to compare conventional tomography, the way that we normally build velocity models with full waveform inversion. So conventional, conventional tomography has these sorts of characteristics. Conventional tomography uses, it uses travel times, it uses very simpl simplified physics, typically it uses, it uses rays or geometric optics, something of that sort to generate its models. It's fast and cheap and those are advantages. Uh, it's well established and robust, so people know how to use it. Uh, they know how to stop it going wrong. They understand how to make it work, so that's also a big advantage. So these, these are all advantages. But the big disadvantage of conventional tomography is that it has quite low spatial resolution, and the spa spatial resolution is fundamentally limited to be of the order of a Fresnel zone. And the Fresnel zone is shown here. It's a square, approximately the square root of the wavelength of the data, so lambda is the wavelength, the seismic wavelength, and d is the distance, some measure of the distance that this energy is, has traveled, so how far the, how far the energy has traveled from source to receiver um, in the subsurface. So for many experiments, this is quite a large number, and the travel time tomography cannot see inside that scale length. It can't, it can't um, discover, it can't separate the details of the velocity model on scale lengths smaller than this. So cheap, fast, easy to use, but its resolution is it's very limited. So full waveform inversion turns that all around. Um, the, the, the characteristics of conventional tomography are almost all um, turned around for full waveform inversion. So the first thing it uses, all the, the wave field, it just uses the raw wave field we don't pick travel times or we don't really pre-process the data or anything. We just take the raw data and put it straight into the algorithm. It uses the complete physics or at least a lot more of the physics in understanding wave propagation. Uh, it's expensive. It's many, many orders of magnitude more expensive than travel time tomography. So there's a lot of comp computational effort associated with full waveform inversion. So that's a minus. That, that's dollars, basically, that you have to spend. Um, it's evolving and not yet robust, so that means it's a difficult method to use. You need experts to use it. You need to write careful codes so that, um, um, so that you get the right answer. So this is, this is a disadvantage. So it's expensive and difficult to use. So why would we do it? The reason we do it is because it's got much higher spatial resolution and it can resolve things in the subsurface to of about the scale length of half a wavelength. And half a wavelength is much, much smaller than the Fresnel zone, so this is much, much better spatial resolution 
that we can possibly get from anything based on travel costs. So this is the reason, this is why it's worth spending all this money and all this effort. It's basically to get a model which has got a lot more detail in the, um, um, in the model. But the sort of data that you need to, to run these algorithms is shown here. You typically need long offsets, so you need your source and receiver to be somewhere between three and six times the depth of the target, and they get, so that's quite a large distance. Um, so normally, typically, we only run full waveform inversion down to depths of two or three kilometers, and that's limited because we don't have the very, very long offsets that we would need to look deeper. Uh, we need low frequencies, so two to three hertz is very desirable. And uh, we also like data. We want data with lots of azimuths. Ideally, we like all the azimuths, so we'd like shots and receivers absolutely everywhere so that we generate true, genuine, three-dimensional data, uh, and that helps dramatically. So it is possible to in invert narrow azimuth data, but um, it's, it's more difficult, uh, more limiting to do that. It's better to have, it's better to have as many azimuths as you can, as you can possibly get. Okay, so this is, this is the last slide that I'll show before we move on to looking at the data set. So the, the basic method, the, the fundamental method, works like this. The first thing you need to get started, you need some data that you've collected in the field. You need a starting model, which typically will include anisotropy, and you need a source. You need to know what the source wave looks like. So that, you need those three things to get started. The next thing you do is you have a computer program which is able to take the source and put it in the starting model and generate, predict what the data should look like. So you have your model, put the source in, put the source at all the positions that it really is in the field data, propagate waves through this model and predict what the data should look like. And if this model is perfect, then this predicted data is going to look exactly like the field data and there's nothing else to do, you've earned your money and you can go home. But, but typically, the, the starting model is not good enough. So when you predict the data here, it doesn't match. It doesn't match the field data. So we need to do something about that. So the next thing we do, having got this predicted data, is we need to compare the predicted data and the field data and generate what we call the residual wave field. So the very simplest way to do that is simply to subtract one from the other at the receivers, so to take the data you predict, the data that you see, and, and form the difference. Um, in practice, we normally do more complicated, more sophisticated things at this step, but essentially it's a comparison of the two data sets to generate some measure of, of, of the difference. And having got that residual, that measure of the, um, of the error, basically, in the data, we take the residual data, so the errors at every receiver, and we back propagate that, we treat that as a source, and we send that backwards into the model. So here's my model, here's the source, I've generated data that's gone forwards to the receivers. At the receivers, I've got the errors, and I've sent the errors backwards into the model. So I've got two wave fields, the real data going forwards and the errors going backwards. So that's this step. So I've now got a predicted wave field and a residual wave field. The next step is to cross-correlate those two. I've got these two wave fields, and I cross-correlate them, and actually take the zero lag typically, and having cross-correlated them, that tells me how to update the model. So that, that tells me the way in which I need to update the model, but it's not perfect, and in particular, it's not scaled. So it gives us a picture, but it's not a fully quantitative picture. It doesn't tell us by how much to update the model, it just tells us uh, what, the, what the shape of that update should look like. So that's this stage five. Stage six, we need to do an extra calculation to tell us how to scale this. We call that the step length calculation, and I think people will talk about that later today. And then finally, having scaled the model update, we then update the model, and we go back to here, and we iterate. So we go around this loop from two to seven. We go round and around um, this loop until such time as our residual 
uh, until such time as our residual uh, is small enough and we think we've arrived at a, a, reasonably, good, a reasonably good answer. Uh, where does all the money go? The money goes in the forward modelling, in the um, back propagating of the residuals, and in the step length calculation. Each of those steps costs about the same in computational effort. So this involves propagating all the sources forward through the model. This involves propagating all the receivers basically back through the model. And this typically involves propagating all the sources through a new modified model. So that's basically where all the, all the money goes. And of course, we iterate. And typically, we go around this loop about a hundred times that that sort of number, a few a few tens of times around this um, around this loop. So that's the basic method, and uh, in the I think in the next talk after mine we'll come back to this and basically look at more what what's what's involved computationally with these um, with these steps. Okay, so that's that's the, the background to the method. So now I'm going to take you through a data set, and we'll see we'll see the methods um, actually in use. So the, the data that I'm going to show you has been published, so it's in geophysics. But all, all the images I'm going to show you, all the pictures and the story are in this geophysics paper in 2013. So if you want to, um, if you want to see the original data and look at the images in detail, they're in that, um, uh, they're, they're in that paper. So um, the, the field, the data that I'm going to look at is from a small field called Tomaletin. It's right on the boundary between the UK sector of the North Sea and the Norwegian sector of the North Sea. So on this map, the UK is down here, Norway's up here, there's a boundary down the middle between the, the marine region of the two countries, and the field that I'm interested in is just here. And there are lots of oil fields, lots of large oil fields in this area, and I'm just, um, I'm just looking at this small oil field here, which is this Tomaletin Alpha, um, Tomaletin Alpha oil, oil field. The characteristics of this, the, the data set and the, and the target, this is four component data, so that means three geophones, a vertical, two horizontals, and a, and a hydrophone. They're sitting on the seabed. Um, we're not going to use the geophones. We're only going to use, in this, in this study, we're only going to use the, um, the pressure data measured by the hydrophones. The purpose of the survey is to try to find the... Um, P-wave velocity model above the reservoir. We're not trying to apply FWI at the reservoir. We're just trying to do it above the reservoir. Um, the shallow gas in this section, which causes problems, the shallow gas has got very low velocities. It's got high attenuation. And there's a lot of anisotropy in this section. And I think that's, that's probably the, the other thing that's critical about applying FWI to field data. I think absolutely everywhere in the world, um, there is anisotropy. So here it's quite high, but there's always anisotropy. It's ubiquitous, it's present in all sedimentary basins, and if you're going to try to model the data accurately and really fit the details of the seismic wave field, you have to take into account the anisotropy or you simply get the travel times wrong. You, don't, you can't match the travel times in detail without taking into account anisotropy. So that's that's probably, there are all sorts of different types of physics that we could put into this problem, but adding anisotropy is probably the most important uh, to get right. If, if, you, if you don't do that, then uh, you really can't, really can't fit the data. Um, the survey looks like this. So these lines are the ocean bottom cables. So there's 24 of them. Um, the, that, that's a one kilometer scale bar on there. The yellow region is where the shots are. Um, and this survey was shot in three patches. So, so there are eight cables and uh, shots in this region. And then everything moves along a bit. And then there's a middle set of cables and this patch of shots here. And then the final set of cables and the final um, set of shots. There are four wells. So the dots mark the wells. And this white region in the middle shows roughly where the gas cloud is. So you can see one, one well is outside the gas cloud, one well is inside it, and two of the wells sit right on the edge of the, the gas cloud. And the oil field, of course, sits underneath the gas cloud. The oil well has, the, the oil field has been leaking gas over, over many, many years into the shallow section. So this, this gas, this is very common in the North Sea. You get these gas clouds sitting above the oil reservoir where the, 
gas has leaked up and been trapped in the shallow section above the, um, above the oil reservoir. A few numbers, we're in shallow water, we're in only 75 metres of water. Uh, we have about 100,000 shots. We've got about 6,000 uh, receivers. And um, the whole survey measures, this is about 15 kilometres by about uh, 13 kilometres, something, something of that sort. Um, so that's the, so relatively, relatively small survey, relatively small field, something that it's um, possible to handle on a, on a fairly large university computer. So this is, you don't, you don't need huge HPC systems to handle this particular data set. We can run this reasonably easily um, inside, inside Imperial College. So that's what the data set looks like. Um, the, the data, when it's all stacked conventionally, uh, looks like this. This is, um, so this is four kilometers deep, six kilometers across. This is a fairly uh, one-dimensional, fairly boring plastic section, just interlayer sandstones and shales. Um, in this region, there's a top of chalk here. Uh, the oil field sits in about here somewhere, and this is just this gentle, gentle dome. Uh, it, when you look in detail, there are all sorts of little faults and all sorts of features in here, but on this large scale, you can't, you can't really see them. So that's just what the conventional data looks like. And that's outside, away from the gas cloud. Um, if we move towards the middle of this survey, the gas cloud, the data looks like that. This hole is caused by the gas cloud. The gas cloud sits in here. <coughs> it has high attenuation. Um, it also has a complicated velocity model which distorts the wave field. So it's really quite difficult to image underneath the gas cloud. Um, these bright reflections here and these bright reflections at the side, those are caused by the gas filling the sand layers and not the shale layers and making the reflectivity much brighter. So this is, this is gas filled or partially gas saturated rocks here and here and here. And then this, this hole is basically produced by, by the attenuation and by the distortion of the wave field produced by that, um, by that gas cloud. So the task is to try and see into this region to try and improve the velocity model and to try and improve the imaging and to see into this region and also to improve the, um, the depth imaging here. You can see there, there's a little corner on that um, reflector there. It's sort of flattish, horizontal, and then it's got a bend on it. That corner looks a bit suspicious. That corner there sits more or less underneath the edge of these bright reflectors. So we might think that corner is entirely due to uh, not having the velocity model right due to this, uh, due to this edge, rather than something genuinely in the um, um, in the subsurface. So that's what the what the problem looks like, and th this is migrated with the with the contractor's best uh, best velocity model. Um, the raw field data looks like this. So this is one shot fired into one cable. Um, this this shot's actually the shot's over here somewhere. Uh, you can see this cable starts at an offset of one kilometer, and the time is starting at half a second, so the, the shot's up here somewhere. Um, you can see a few features. The first thing you see is the turning rays, the refracted energy, the energy that's gone down and done this, is very strong. It dominates this data. It dominates many shallow water data sets. So all, most of the energy is in this region. And it's this energy that we're going to use to, tr to invert, to try to get the velocity model. And if we were doing conventional processing, the first thing we would do would be to get rid of this energy. We'd mute it or um, dip filter it in some way, try to remove this uh, and, and throw it away. We're not going to throw it away. We're going to use this strong wide angle energy to build the velocity model. Uh, you can see some reflections. There are some shallow reflections in here that are quite strongly masked by the direct arrivals. Uh, top chalk reflector is in here somewhere. Uh, the reservoir is about there. That, that might be the reservoir, that reflector there. Um, if you look at the top chalk, you can see it's quite bright. And then its amplitude drops as we increase offset. So here its amplitude is dropped. And then its amplitude comes back up again. This region is where reflections from the top of the chalk have gone post-critical. So there's subcritical reflections here. 
a normal ABO response, and then here, the chalk is very fast, so the energy is being totally internally reflected. So these are post-critical wide-angle reflections from the top of the chalk, and all the energy that hits the chalk at that angle is all reflected back. So again, normally when you're processing this, you would mute these reflections here. They've got funny phases and funny amplitudes, and you don't really want those in the migration. So normally you would mute through here somewhere and throw those events away. Uh, that energy is also going to be very useful in the inversion. So mostly in the inversion, we're going to use this stuff and this stuff, and that's almost entirely energy that, um, that conventional processing would, uh, would throw away. Um, the other thing I should say is this is full of multiples. So this complicated wave train here, it's full of multiples and ghosts. Some of those multiples are um, simple bounties in the seawater. Some of them are simple multiples from the surface. Some of them are uh, multiples from beneath the seabed. So a whole range of multiples and ghosts sitting in here. And uh, in, in conventional processing, uh, this is a multiple as well down here. So in conventional processing, you try and get rid of the multiples. You try and take the multiples and ghosts out of the data. But we don't do that in full waveform inversion. We leave everything in there uh, and we try and model it. So we try to model the multiples try and model the ghosts, try and model everything, and use that to help us to get the, um, help us to get the velocity model. So that's the data. And the next thing we've got to do is decide what frequency to start at. So we can look at the power spectrum of that data. So this is what it looks like. So this is frequency along the top from 0 to 20 hertz. Uh, this is power spectrum, so this is dB down relative to the, the 0 dB at the top here. You can see the data is fairly flat from about 7 hertz upwards. So the acquisition contractor has done a fairly good job at making quite a, nice, uh, quite a nice source with a nice flat top to the spectrum. But below about 7 hertz, this data ramps off very, very rapidly uh, to low frequency. So the first question is how low, how low can you go? And if you just looked at the spectrum, you'd think, well, I should start at about 7 hertz or maybe 6 hertz, even at 6 hertz, and 15 dB down at the, on the data at about 10 hertz. So I can't go much below um, 6 or 7 hertz. Um, in fact, you can. In fact, you can go much, much further down in frequency. And um, you can see that in this picture. So this picture shows just a single receiver gather. So the receiver's here. So this is the receiver at this position. Each one of these dots is a shot. So this is um, east-west, this is north-south. There's, there's, there's the receiver, and each one of the dots, each of the colored dots on here, is a particular shot fired into that receiver. And all we've done here is Fourier, Fourier transform the data, take out a single frequency, and we're just plotting the phase. So this is what the phase of the data looks like at 2.5 hertz, at 3 hertz, and at about 3.5 hertz. And um, if the phase is continuous, if it's continuous in space, it basically tells us that there is good signal to noise at that frequency. Um, so you can see at 3.5 hertz, the signal to noise is extremely good. There's, there's lots and lots of signal, very little noise. Everything's very continuous in space. So even though the signals are small, the noise is even smaller and um, the data is nice, nice and continuous. And some of the features you can see, so these lines here, these are missing shot lines. So the, the shooting boat is sailing backwards and forwards. So here, for whatever reason, one of the guns was missing and wasn't firing. Similarly there, one of the guns wasn't firing. And the same here. And there are occasional other odd shots that, uh, that are missing during the, during the acquisition. So that shows exactly the data that was acquired by this one, one receiver. So 3.5 hertz, things look good. At 3 hertz, we've still got lots of coherency. 2.5 hertz, the signal to noise is beginning to get really rather poor. There still is some spatial coherence, but the signal to noise now is less than one to one. Here it's about one to one, here it's a lot better than one to one. So from these sorts of pictures, you can see we're okay to start at three hertz. We've got lots of good signal to noise at three hertz. Um, so we can start there. You might try to push this down to about two and a half hertz, but that will introduce some extra noise, and that's probably a step too far for this particular data set. So although the, um, 
although the spectrum looks like this and it looks like that's the lowest frequency you've got, in fact, we start down here. So we're starting at about minus 45 dB on the top of the, 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 the maximum in the spectrum. It's, so it's not the absolute energy that matters, it's the signal to noise. And at 3 hertz, we've still got good, uh, we've still got good signal to noise, so we're happy to start there. In fact, we start here and we end about here. So that our bandwidth is entirely on this, uh, on this slope. We never actually get up as high as 7 hertz. For full waveform inversion, 7 hertz is beginning to be quite a high frequency. So we, we're, we're in this, we work entirely in this, uh, in this region down here. So that's the, um, that's the field data again. So what I'm going to do with that field data is pre-process it. And my pre-processing is very unlike the sort of pre-processing that you would apply to conventional reflection data. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to mute right ahead of the first breaks. So I'm going to take out any noise before the data has arrived. Uh, there are some Schulte waves. Schulte waves are the marine equivalent of surface waves. They're waves traveling on the seabed, um, el elastic waves basically traveling on the seabed. I mute those. I'm going to use an acoustic wave equation, and it can't properly model those. Um, it can't model those Schulte waves at all, so I get rid of those. Um, I will chop off the late arrivals. I'll kill all the frequencies above 8 hertz. I'll get rid of most of the receivers. I'll get rid of most of the sources. I'll get rid of the very shortest offsets. Um, I get rid of the geophones. Um, and the final thing I do is I pr will pretend that sources are receivers and receivers are sources. We do that because it's basically it's expensive. Sources are expensive and receivers are cheap. So in this data set, Originally, I've got a lot of sources and not very many receivers, so I pretend I swap the data around and pretend it's the other way around, and that makes it much cheaper to compute. So most of what I'm doing is throwing data away here. I'm muting things, getting rid of channels, throwing data away. Um, somebody spent an awful lot of money to acquire this data, and uh, mostly what I've done is throw away most of what they what they paid the money for. Um, so that's my pre-processing, what it does, it takes that data set, which was expensive, and it turns it into this one. So this is the data that I'm going to invert. So that's, that's my pre-processing. So I've thrown away high frequencies. I've thrown away most of the data. Um, I've muted, this is, oops. This is muting the Schulte waves in here, and I've muted ahead of the early arrivals in there. I've kept all the, um, direct arrivals and turning rays. I've kept this top chalk reflector. That's the top chalk reflector going post-critical. This is the subcritical reflections, subcritical reflections in there. But mostly what I'm going to invert are these arrivals on this one. So that's the pre-processing. It looks almost exactly the reverse of what you would do for conventional processing. For conventional processing, you throw this away you'd throw that away, you'd keep the high frequencies, you'd throw away the low frequencies, and you would, um, you'd keep all the data, all the data volume, and you'd use the geophones and the hydrophones. So that's, that's the pre-processing. So that volume, this data volume is a lot smaller than the original data volume. And the next thing I need is a starting model. So this shows a vertical slice through this 3D starting model. Um, the starting model was made from travel time tomography. Um, it's more or less a one-dimensional model, so the background model is one-dimensional. This is the top chalk, so you can see this anticlinal dome. This is the gas cloud sitting in the, um, sitting in the model. And apart from the gas cloud and this anticline and one or two other features that are possibly artifacts, it's a fairly one-dimensional model. So the travel time tomography has, um, um, has, has generated that model, that's through the edge of the gas cloud, uh, and this one's right through the middle of the gas cloud. So this is, this is slap bang through the middle, so this feature here is the, the very intense gas cloud um, in the middle, right over the top of the anticline. And you can see what's happening geologically, basically there's an oil field in here, and it's leaking gas up, and the gas is creeping up, and building this, um, building this gas cloud in the shallow section. And if you look at the depth here, the oil field is down at about three and a half kilometers. And our target, our velocity target, is 
sitting between about one and two kilometres. It's, it's this feature, really, that we need to image to, um, or need to capture to improve, improve the imaging. So that's where we get the velocity model from, from conventional travel time tomography. This is the model that was used to depth migrate the, um, the, original, the original data. And we also need an anisotropy model, and I won't go through how we build that, but there is an anisotropy model you need. Well, it's very helpful if you have at least one well to help steer that um, anisotropy model. And you can see the anisotropy values in here. You possibly can't read them, but they're quite high. So here this, the epsilon is 20%. Here the epsilon is 19%. Here it's 13%. Here it's 14%. So the, the percentage anisotropy is quite high. So what, what, what does epsilon mean? It means that the horizontal, the velocity of horizontal traveling energy is 20% higher than the velocity of vertically traveling energy. That, that's essentially what these what these numbers mean. And then delta is a measure of what happens at intermediate angles. So 20% is quite a lot of, um, of, of anisotropy. And if you don't include that in the modeling and in the inversion, then you really won't get the, um, won't get the right. So you need an anisotropy model. And then the final thing you need is a source. And where do you get that from? The most obvious place is to get it from the contractor. So contractors have various ways of estimating and um, measuring their wavelets. And uh, over the years, they've put a lot of effort into that. So this shows, the in this survey, this is the contractor's estimate of what the wavelet looks like. So this is the first kick. This is the ghost, surface ghost. And then this is the bubble, which they've tried to um, suppress, basically, by designing a careful, um, a careful air gun array. And typically, contractors model these things for 400 milliseconds. That's normally what their modeling codes do. And this is a pretty good estimate of what that source would look like. This is a direct observation of the data. So this is a receiver on the seabed sitting underneath the source, scaled to make the amplitudes look the same. And you can see it looks really quite similar to the true source. It has some extra features. This is a sea bottom multiple. So that C bottom multiple is present in the data. It's not present, of course, in the, um, in the contractor's wavelet. And then there's some other features which will be multiples and start to be reflections um, in the subsurface. So if you looked at that, you might think that was a good estimate of the source. And indeed, it is a good, it is a good estimate above about 6, 7, 8 hertz. It's a, it's a very good estimate between 6 hertz and about 100 hertz. But if you look at it at low frequency, and that's what's shown here. This is this picture is these two these two sources, the contractor's wavelet and the, um, the the direct observation of the data, just through a low pass filter. And I've also this is 400 milliseconds. This is now three times as long. This is 1.2 seconds. So it's it's a longer um, piece of data. You can see now that the data and the um, predicted source really don't match at all. There's a big phase error, a big phase shift between the two. So this, this peak here and this peak here and this trough and this trough, they don't line up at all. There's a very significant phase error between the field data and the um, contractor's wavelet at low frequency. And that's very, very common. It's common partly because typically contractors only, or historically, have only calculated these things to 400 milliseconds. And if we're trying for 400 milliseconds, it's about here somewhere. If we're trying to work at three seconds, 400 milliseconds is not enough. And also because these um, estimates really don't model the, uh, the, um, the bubble very accurately. They model the beginning because that's normally what, what we're interested in at high frequency. But they don't model the physics of the bubble terribly accurately. And that's what dominates these data. These are completely dominated by the bubble. They really don't see the initial bang of the air guns that the um, contractors work so hard to make nice at higher frequency. At low frequency, that's almost, almost entirely invisible. So, so the message here is you, can't, you often can't trust the, um, the simple estimates that people have for the source wavelet. You have to go to the field data. You have to build your own estimate and really make sure that you have a good source. And I think this, this, this uh, estimate here was made in about uh, 2008, 2009, I think 
contractors shooting today are much more aware of this and they can model these things uh, much better uh, than they used to. But if the data's if the data is not a brand new data set, or even if it is, it's it's still very important to get the source right and really check that what looks like the source is really still the source at low frequency. So that's a that's a common cause of of, um, of problems in FWR. ways mostly that contractors will determine the source. They will sometimes simply model it, so they know where everything is, they have a good understanding of the physical area and so they can model that and generate the source. Uh, the second thing they can do is they can build the source, but they can have it out into deep water somewhere, they can put a hydrophone or one of the reefers underneath it and measure it. That's quite expensive and difficult and hard to do other than in special experiments. Often they generally don't do that. But the third way they can do that is to do things is put hydrophones close to the gun, so in the near field, and they combine a mixture of modeling and the near hydrophone measurements, and that's probably how this was done. This was probably done with near hydrophone measurements, coupled with physical modeling that can make that source. If they're very good at that, and that's all fine. The problem is when they do it, they do it in order to make things right. From about six to 100 Hertz, and they, they never, when they set up the code 20 years ago, set up the, the, the system 20 years ago, they never thought it would be interesting in data at 324 Hertz. So they simply haven't validated and don't use these coupled kind of low frequencies. And, and it's just as the people that just in your model. So they do that very, very well, and it all looks great. But actually, what they do, I mean, Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're aware of this, and they, they're doing better, but not as data already exists. Yeah. Right. So, Mike, what's the reason why, why aren't you estimating the source function on the fly? So, yeah, okay, so, so how do you estimate the source? So, you, so I guess there's two ways, two philosophies almost to deal with the source. So one is to try to figure out what the source is before you do the inversion, and that's what I'm doing here, is trying to work out the source independently of the subsurface model. The other way to do it is try to include the source as an unknown during the inversion. So try to try to invert the source as you go along. Um, it's possible to do both, and uh, in practice, I think most people do a, a mixture of both. The, 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 the reason that I'm less keen to invest, less keen to invert for the source during the inversion, I suppose it's two things. It's first that I think it's not it's not sensible really, or it's not it, it surely isn't the best way to get the source is surely not to build a very complex model of the subsurface and require that you need to know that complex model in order to get the source. It seems to me we ought to be able to get the source more simply only knowing about the properties of seawater, the properties of the seabed. So if you do it in the inversion, it gets, it, 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 it seems crazy that to know something really rather simple, we have to build a fantastically complicated model to do it. So that's one reason. The second reason is that there's always a trade-off. You can always hide, if you start with the wrong velocity model, you can always hide, or there's a concern that you can hide some of the unknown about the subsurface in the source. So if you've got a systematic error in the velocity model, that you can turn that into a systematic time shift or phase shift in the source, and once you've done that, you'll never know and you'll never recover. So you can you can move structure out of the earth and into the source if you're not careful. What I would concede is in practice that doesn't often seem to happen. But so when you do it in practice, it does seem 
very often to be perfectly safe to invert for the source, and you don't seem to put structure into the source. And I don't see fundamentally why, I don't see how we can tell, and I don't know any QC that would tell you when that had happened. So we would, we would prefer to build the source first, and then, and then perhaps invert for it a little, check for it while we're doing the inversion, but, but we'd like, we, we think it's better to get it right at the beginning than, it, than assume you know nothing about it. Yeah, it's sort of interesting, but maybe we can leave that for the discussion. It's refined. I mean, many people do invert for it. I know you do. I know um, Chevron often do. I know the contractors often do. But I, I don't know of a, I don't know how you can QC after you've done that to tell you whether you've got, whether you've moved structure from the model into the source. Well, you limit I just the complexity of the source, but it's not a linear problem you're solving. It's a nonlinear problem. Linear, you have to define default, right? You don't yes, know, yes. But it's, now it's, non it's not that non-linear if, if the error is in a shallow layer quite close to the surface. I agree it's non-linear, but it's not that non-linear. Uh, so, so I think perhaps I'm more concerned about it than others. But, uh, and, and, and Felix's approach, I, I have to confess, it does seem to work. But uh, it does concern me that perhaps you can't tell when it goes wrong. So we've, we have the data, we have a model, we have an isotropy, we have a source, so we're ready to invert. So we run our algorithm, which is forward propagate, backwards propagate, cross correlate, step length, and iterate. So that's the algorithm that we'll spend lots of time this week talking about and trying to improve and trying, trying to change and trying to speed up and so on. So what, what I'm going to do now is look at the results. So this was the... This was the um, the starting model for a slice through the edge of the gas cloud, and this is what it turns into. So that's the result of from the, running the inversion. So the first thing to note is it's quite similar. It hasn't changed dramatically, and, and it can't. We're doing a local inversion, so the, 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 the answer we get must look quite like the starting model, but it has changed in a lot of its details. We've got this little feature here, which is the gas creeping up a fault. We have the gas creeping out along the stratigraphy. Um, there are some differences in here. The deeper part of the gas cloud has changed. The, the one-dimensional background model, well, actually, it's now quite different on one side um, to the other side. So a number, of, a number of changes. If we move right into the middle of the gas cloud, so this is a line right through the middle, and you can see the gas cloud here is fairly blocky. It was probably strongly influenced by a human interpreter who, who put that gas cloud into this model, which is why it's got these rather square edges. And um, when we run the inversion, it looks like this. Again, this little feature at the top here is the, the gas moving along faults. It goes deeper into the section. Um, you can see the gas creeping out along the stratigraphy. So these low velocities here are the gas moving sideways um, along the stratigraphy, and you can also see at the top of the um, top of the chalk. Originally, this was an anticline. There's now a low velocity zone sits in there. That's right in the reservoir, and it's telling us the reservoir is overpressured. So there are high anomalous pressures, anomalous fracturing in that reservoir. The reservoir is overpressured, and we see that in the velocity model. So it tells us something very directly about the um, um, the reservoir region. Tells us that. Um, there's an there's a, a anomalous high pressure sitting in that, that region. So that's interesting to produce the reservoir. It's also a drilling hazard. Well, all this lots of drilling hazard too. So lots, lots and lots of drilling hazards into getting into that, uh, um, into that reservoir. So again, it's changed. The changes are not dramatic, but they are quite significant, and they will change what the migration looks like. Um, and that, that, that high pressure zone there in the reservoir is also significant to the... Um, to the engineers. So those are the vertical slices. We can look at some horizontal slices. This is a shallow horizontal slice. It's at a depth of uh, 250 meters. The original model at this depth was completely uniform. So this was just a pale blue color for the inversion was running. Um, these red things here are low velocity subglacial sub channels. So this is in the North Sea. The whole area was glaciated about 20,000 years ago. So this is, these are basically subglacial meltwater channels that ran out underneath 
uh, underneath the glacier that were later infilled with faster, um, faster material. So that, that's what these features are. Um, and you can see some even smaller features. You can see some little stripes in here and round that corner and in there. Those are all real. I'll show you those, I'll show you those later. They look perhaps like artifacts, but those are all real features, these little, little things in here in the velocity model. Um, there are some artifacts, these uh, east-west things. Those are missing shot lines, and you can see some vertical striping. Those are due to where the cable's located. So there is a footprint shallow in the data. There is a footprint from the acquisition system, um, but the, the, most of the major features are, uh, are real in that section. And I'll, I'll QC those for you in, in a minute. Um, moving deeper, this is through the gas cloud. So this is a slice at 1.2 kilometers. This is the starting model. There's the gas cloud in the starting model. Here are the four wells. We'll look later at, at some um, sonics in that particular well. And um, you can see in the starting model, this well sits right inside the, um, uh, the gas cloud. And then when we look at the inversion result, it looks like this. So if I click backwards and forwards, you can see what's changed. So quite a lot's changed. This well has moved outside the gas cloud. It was inside and it's moved outside. The purple color is much lower velocities than originally. So the gas cloud is much more intense in this region. These uh, funny wings, funny features on the gas cloud, that's where the gas is moving out along faults. So there's a fault here fault here, there's a fault right through there that you might just about be able to see. There's another one through there. So the gas is creeping out along, um, along faults. So we've gone from a fairly smooth, not very intense gas cloud to a much more um, complicated and much more intense, much, much deeper, uh, much lower velocities in the middle of the gas cloud than we, uh, than we had before. And uh, critically at this depth, this particular well has moved from inside to outside. Um, the gas cloud. So that's. Yeah, so we. Um, the water in this inversion was not allowed to go below the velocity of seawater. And that. Um, that so this purple colour is about 1,500 metres a second. It's deeper in the section. The velocities do get down to 1,500 metres a second. And probably that's not low enough. Yes, it, it basically is. It's, there's a problem. There's a problem with these sorts of inversions, which I won't really go into now. But it's to do with data. So the pictures that I'm showing you are what you don't really know. And we have to on data too. You don't really know the density in gas cloud. So we use, typically we use Gardner's law to deal with density. Gardner's law is completely wrong in the gas cloud. And that's, that's one of the features that needs, um, that needs dealing with in order to get these very low velocities of gas as well. But we haven't done that in these, in these results. Uh, we've, just, we've just followed Gardner's law, even in, even in the gas cloud. So that's the results. So what I'm going to show you now is try and demonstrate how we validate these results and to show you that the... Um, the, the the results are, are correct. So there's a number of ways that you could validate things, and validation is really important. It's easy. Full waveform inversion will always make pictures. It will always reduce the size of the functional. It will always improve the uh, cross-correlation between the field data and the predicted data. But what you want to know is, has it done it for the right reason? So validation is important. So I'll, I'll show the various ways that it's possible to validate things. So first of all, we'd like to validate these channels. So how do we know these channels are real and not just some artifact in the, um, um, in the acquisition or something? After, after all, this feature here is an, is an acquisition artifact. It's due to a missing shot line. So how do we know this isn't some, some funny artifact? So one thing you can do is compare this velocity model to the migrated data. So we can put the um, pre-stat depth migration over the top. So that is the pre-stat depth migrated data that we have at this shallow depth. There's not very much of it because at very shallow depths, sources and receivers need to be very close together. And then we've only got receivers in the middle. So out here, we've only got shots. We don't have any receivers out here at all. 
So we've only got data in the middle. Also at 250 meters, there's a very strong footprint in the uh, Bristat depth migrated reflection image. Um, so that's why the data looks very stripy. Um, but what you can see is there's a strong correlation between the two data sets. So this one, the colors mean velocity. In this one, the colors mean uh, reflectivity. So there's no, there's no um, sort of a priori reason why the absolute velocities and the reflectivity should correlate, um, but they very often do. And here you can see they correlate, and they correlate in detail. So if you look down in this region, the velocity model has um, two little lobes in it, a lobe here and a lobe there, and um, the PSDM has exactly the same structure. Um, if you look in this region, the, um, the velocity model has these funny little stripes, and it turns a corner and a little piece up there outside the main channel. And the, the PSDM has the same thing. If you look carefully, you see this little, these little red stripes, and you see a red piece there. They sit in the same place. They're the same geometry. They're quite different data sets. This is all made from wide-angle turning rays. This is made from reflection data. So they're independent data sets, processed differently. They're different parameters. They've got exactly the same geometry. So that gives you a lot of confidence that the detailed features in here are, are, are the correct features. They're, they're, they're sitting there and sitting in the, uh, in the right place. It doesn't prove it, but it gives you a lot of confidence that they're, um, that they're the same, especially when you see the fine details. You see the two lobes and you see these really quite fine details of structure sitting in, sitting in exactly the, the same place. Um, the other thing that's interesting, the reflection data only tells you about the middle of the survey, but full wave form inversion works. You don't need sources and receivers, you just need one or the other. So we can get these channels out here where we haven't got any receivers at all. We've only got shots. So the velocity model is much bigger than the, um, the model that you get from the, um, the reflection data. Basically, if there's a shot here, that energy travels from that shot. It travels through this channel, and it ends up on a receiver here, and that can tell you about this channel. So it's not like CDP imaging at all. It's, we're doing tomography, so we get a tomo tomographic image essentially everywhere that we have um, a reasonable coverage of, um, of data. So it's not like CDP imaging. It's, it's a different quite a different approach. Um, we can do the same thing deeper in the section. Um, so here's this deep, deeper slice through the um, gas cloud. The red picture here is um, a well, the, the, what the model looks like through that well. So the red is the starting model. The gray is the uh, sonic measured in that well. And this arrow here marks this slice. So you can see here, the, um, the starting model does not match the well very well. Um, at this depth, there's the sonic. The sonic is quite fast. The starting velocity model is quite low. So the starting model is predicting that the well is inside the gas cloud, which is what you see. The sonic is telling us actually the gas cloud is, um, the well is outside the gas cloud. The gas cloud doesn't, doesn't start at this well until we, until we get down here. So there's a big mismatch in the starting model, when we run the full waveform inversion, it looks like this, and you can see the, um, the well moves outside the gas cloud. There's now much closer agreement between the model and, uh, and the well, and that, that um, much improved well tie gives us a lot more, gives us a lot of confidence that, um, at least over this depth interval, that the velocity model here is, is, is correct, and the model is right to move the edge of that gas cloud and move the well outside the, um, outside the gas. This well is not used in the inversion. The inversion is just, it's driven by the seismic data, but it clearly fits the, um, it clearly fits the well better. So let me just show that again. So we're clearly, the, 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 this starting model was presumably made by an interpreter who looked at the seismic data and thought that this region, they could see evidence for gas in the section, and so they, they pushed the gas cloud out here, and that was clearly mistaken, uh, and that now we've got the well, we can see that that was, that was mistaken, and the FWI does that and reproduces that. So that's, so, so tying to wells is, is, a, is, a, is a good way to validate things. The same thing we'd like to do is look at these funny wings, what are, what are all these strange features? They, they've all appeared from the FWI, so are those real? So we can do what we did before, we can compare to the, um, 
the, the migrated data. So that's shown here. So this is a velocity model, and then this is just a slice through the migrated data. So these colors here are basically migration amplitudes or reflectivity. And you can see this, this feature here appears, and this feature here, and this feature here, and a little feature in there. So all those, all those wings, all those features in the velocity model, you basically see them appearing in the, um, in the reflection data. And you can see the broad region of, um, of low velocity is also picked out. There's clearly something, something quite anomalous in the reflection data at that depth. And, and you can see that in the, um, um, in the velocity model. So the detailed features, the small scale features also correlate between the velocity model and the reflection data. So the wells plus that correlation gives us confidence. Um, the next thing we can do is to try to look at the match to the field data. So here's a field data, a bit of field data. The shot's here somewhere. This is the cable. These are the direct arrivals. This is the reflection from the top of the chalk. And you can see something funny happens here. This chalk, top chalk reflection, it's all post-critical. And then just at that point, it stops. And then this is pre-critical. And there's a sort of diffraction almost from the edge of that reflection. Why does that come about? It comes about because the gas cloud has an edge. So energy that gets to here has been through the gas cloud, and energy that gets to here has not been through the gas cloud. The gas cloud changes the angle of the ray pass, and it changes whether the energy is post-critical or pre-critical. So that feature there is very strongly influenced by exactly where the gas cloud sits. So that change in amplitude is, is influenced by that. So we'll, we'll use that. That gets used in the inversion. We'll try to match that edge. And this dotted line shows the mute that I applied. Everything inside there was muted. So I'm not trying to use data inside that, um, inside that dotted line. So that's the field data. This is the data from the starting model. And you can see this feature in particular is not very well matched. It's, um, it's present, but it really doesn't have this character at all. This bright region here is completely missing. And you can see in the early arrivals, the travel times are good. So this travel time here is pretty well exactly the same as that travel time. But all these little features, this little feature, this little feature, this little feature, that little feature, they're not present in, this, um, in, the, uh, in the starting model data. So the starting model doesn't give us the fine details. Uh, the FWI data looks like this. So this is the data predicted from the final FWI model. And you can see now it does more or less predict this high amplitude. It does predict this edge. It does predict a diffraction from the edge. And it does get the position and character of that event really quite um, accurately reproduced. Even the cyclicity of this end here is, is quite well produced. And it starts to match these small details. So that little detail there is matched, this little detail is matched, this hole here uh, is matched. There's a hint at least of that little hole in there being matched. So it's starting to match the fine detail. So as I go backwards and forwards, you can see this is rather bland and doesn't match the details. And this is beginning to match the details. So it's the difference between these two pictures, that difference, that's where the channels come from. That's where the faults come from. That's where the sharp boundaries on the gas cloud, all of those features are contained in the differences between those two data sets. So we're modeling, we're modeling the subsurface just using these really quite subtle, really quite fine differences between these two data sets. So it's nothing like reflection imaging. If it was reflection imaging, you'd say, but I do need to get the whole model right in order to, to match that feature and match that feature and match that feature and match that feature. So there's no simple one-to-one -one relationship between the data and the model. You have to get everything right, basically, to get the, get the model. And they're quite subtle, quite, quite, small, quite small changes to build this velocity model. So that's an important QC. Um, 
you can QC things in great detail, so you can look at one field trace and one predicted trace, and they really should match. So that's what's done here. The traces are paired up, the field trace and the um, predicted trace, and they really should match wiggle for wiggle and their amplitudes and their timing, and something's gone wrong. So we can, we can, um, we can compare traces wiggle for wiggle, that's a, Q, a very good QC, but it's quite tedious to do because we have uh, many, many millions of traces. But, but looking at a subset of those and making sure things really match and that they match for the right reasons, that we're really matching the right phase with the right phase, um, is, is an important QC. Um, we can also look at flatness of gathers, and this is actually not such a good QC because normally our starting model will have been made by flattening these gathers and they'll normally be fairly flat to start with. And you can certainly see up here, they are, they are pretty flat. So that's the, that's the starting model. That's the full waveform model. So they do get a bit flatter in places. Um, down here, they get, they get a bit flatter. Um, but that's not a, not a terribly useful QC. Normally, they start out fairly flat. And after full waveform inversion, they're still fairly flat. And you certainly need to make sure they haven't got any worse. But it, 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 looking at the flatness of gathers does not normally tell you a, a great deal about the quality of, uh, of what you've done, but it will tell you if it's gone horribly wrong. Um, and then finally, perhaps the most important QC is to see how it migrates the data. Um, it's the most important because it's the one we really want, but um, it's also, you can't migrate the data until you've spent all the money. So it's a very late QC. You can't find out that you spent your money unwisely until you've spent it all. So, so it's an important QC, but you need to do, you need to do things much earlier um, in, in, the, in, the, in the processing than, the, than simply do the migration. So this is what I show you, showed you before. This is migrated with the starting model. This is migrated with the final model, and it makes a huge difference um, in, this, in this case. And it makes, the most important thing is that it makes the final migrated image simpler. So the model itself is much more complicated. It's got those funny wings. It's got those channels. It's got all sorts of extra features in. So the velocity model has got very complicated, but the migrated result has got much simpler. And the only way that can happen, the only way we can remove complexity by adding some complicated velocity model is really if the velocity model is right. It's very, very difficult to put a complicated velocity model into a migration algorithm and yet make that give you a simpler model unless the model is right. So the fact that the migration has got simpler, that these have got more continuous, that this has got flatter, all of those things are indications that we're on the right lines. So this may not be the perfect answer, it may not be the right answer, but it's a lot more right than we started out. And I think, I think that's perhaps the final message of full waveform inversion. Our um, our aim in full waveform inversion is not to get a perfect model, it's not to get a perfect match, it's not to get a perfect solution. Our aim is to get a model that's significantly better than the one we started out with. So it's to make a significant improvement to the results. And that we will we'll use that principle a lot when we write algorithms. We don't need to write a perfect algorithm, but we do need to write an algorithm that makes things better. And if we can, if we can improve the model and make a better image, and get closer to reality, that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to do, we're not trying to solve a, a to get to a perfect, um, a perfect solution. And we know, we know we do all sorts of things wrong in full waveform inversion. We make all sorts of approximations that are not true. We're happy to do that because it gets us in an affordable way to do a final answer. Um, so, let, so let me summarize here. So I think what I've shown you is anisotropic 3D full waveform inversion works on field data. It's important it's anisotropic. We need low frequencies currently. We need refracted energy, so we need this energy that's gone down and, and turned round. We need currently pretty careful QC and careful validation to make it all work. So these things are all limitations on full waveform inversion. So when you do everything properly, it works. One of the questions, perhaps the central question, for this meeting and this, um, this research program that we're taking forwards is can we do better? And what we mean by can we do better mostly is can we get around these things? So can we set this up so we don't really need low frequencies? 
so we can manage with reflections and not refractions. So the need for careful QC and a very good starting model and careful validation things, can we get round these, these limitations? So this is what we're trying to do. I, I'm sh absolutely certain the answer is yes, um, but it'll be a lot of work to, uh, to deliver the answer. Okay, so that, that's your introduction. So I'll, thank you. That's it.